PhD student in UCD working on relative energy deficiency in sport. And this is partly funded by the Irish Institute of Sport. Um, and working with um, the main nutritionist out there, Sharon Madigan and Dr. Claire Corish in UCD. And you're actually using Nutritix uh, at present, a, a yeah. form of that app for a particular study group, isn't that right? Yeah, so before Christmas we carried out some uh, research with the Irish Army and we've been using that app to, to collect the data. Okay, and is there a particular thing you're looking at? Yeah, so we're looking at just the overall quality of the diet and how much they're actually eating. So we just needed uh, a device that was easily accessible for them to use and that was going to um, aid us to collect the best quality. So we had access to the recipes and everything in the cookhouse beforehand, so all that information was inputted. Um, so it was just as simple for the cadets to look up the recipes that we had developed and select their portion size. So it was as quick as uh, Kieran has done there and showed us. So you've used it and you're still here, so it's good. Yeah. It's good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Nigel, uh, tell, us a tell us a bit about what you're up to now. So uh, my name's Nigel Mitchell. I'm a registered dietitian and sports nutritionist. Uh, currently, I uh, work with the English Institute of Sport, and that's the invite we're off career tonight as a technical lead of our, my work there is around the professional development mentoring of junior practitioners. In addition to that, I also work in, uh, in sports, so work within professional cycling, and over the years, you name it, I've worked with that sport, uh, worked with over 30 Olympic gold medalists and uh, premiership football clubs, uh, Tour de France winners, so you name it, done it in sport. Also, other academic interests as well. Do uh, the same principles apply across different sports? The, the basic principles tend to be quite similar. It's looking at how you apply them in the different settings. So some of the work I'm doing at the moment is with Olympic sailors. And interestingly, that's very, very similar to professional cyclists. Uh, where it's looking at how you apply it in the environment and the situation that those athletes are in. Okay. Uh, Sarah? I'm a registered dietitian as well, and I work a lot with companies who are trying to look at products, and particularly around health claims, nutrition claims on the products. And then we'd also work in a lot with workplace wellness, where people are trying to develop menus to assist staff to kind of make healthier choices. So we would use Nutritics a huge amount to analyse the recipes and then to pull out the health claims, nutrition claims. And I suppose I often say I'm the person who says no a lot when companies come along and they say, we want to make this claim or that claim. And are like, well, actually, no. And so we'd help them navigate a lot of the legislation um, but just having really good, accurate information to base that on has just been essential. What would you say is the most uh, bastardised word <laughs> that, that, that you have to say, you can't say that? What oh, kind God. Of words um, that are actually probably boost. in our public discourse? Boost. boost and superfood. They'd be yeah. two. I'm all the time going, look, just don't go there. Yeah. Um, so we, we do take those off quite a bit. Okay, very good. Uh, it's Niall or Neil, sorry. Niall, uh, no, yeah. Niall. Uh, so I'm also a registered dietitian and uh, sports nutritionist by background. Um, predominantly worked in industry, but also have experience working with uh, the Olympics, uh, rugby clubs, as well as uh, intercounty GA players. Uh, more recently, I set up a company called Pow Cow, um, which is a uh, f healthy frozen yogurt product. So uh, I'm well and truly embedded in the food industry at this stage, but uh, <laughs> whether or not I've crossed over to the dark side is another one. <laughs> um, how long have you been in uh, the food industry in one form or another? Um, probably roughly since 2011, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Pri prior to Pau Cow, it was a, as, a diet, as a dietitian? As a dietitian, so I worked in Aramark. I set up the nutrition department for um, Aramark Ireland at the time um, and then moved into Danone and worked in the regulatory affairs department there and then subsequently out in the field as well. So, And just to broaden out the discussion into kind of general question and staying with yourself now, how, um, how, is, how have you seen the area of nutrition evolve over the last most of a decade, what's what's changed? Um, I suppose quite a lot. The fundamentals are the same. Um, in terms of specifically looking at sports, I suppose, um, you know, there's a, a lot more research now, I guess, but to back up in terms of the whole protein piece. Um, and also we're looking kind of more towards the impact that sleep has as well, particularly on um, athletes, particularly for recovery and the impact even sleep in general population as well and in terms of um, overeating and, and causing weight gain as well has a major impact. So that's probably been something that's been quite interesting, something I, I would follow. Um, 
And yeah, I suppose th there's a lot of fads that have come and gone in the meantime as well. I'm sure they'll still come on the, over the next decade as well, yeah. Sarah, would you say um, that in terms of the way people talk about food, that maybe we're, even with, because this is called connecting or in, you know, connecting different professionals, that the kind of study around food, what's good for you, what you should eat, uh, has been in one silo, and then people are looking at sleep in another area, and then they were looking at exercise, and that maybe through technology we're finally starting to bring yeah, that I holistic mean, thing together. I mean, that's been coming for an awfully long time, and you would have seen it probably faster in sports, but also in elderly. Um, where, say, I'm 20 years and plus at this, you would have talked about nutrition in terms of old age, but then there was looking at nutrition and exercise in old age, and now we're looking at nutrition and exercise and oral health and so on. So that's all joining together. That, as you said, it's not just one thing on its own. But I think what you're saying about things that have changed in the 20 years since I became a dietitian is social media has just been enormous. And that, say, when I qualified, you were actually regarded as an expert. I mean, not, not by your family, because they never believe you. Um, <laughs> but other people. But now these days, there's this huge challenge on social media and I think you said earlier somebody has a blog therefore they're an expert and I think that's been a really big challenge and you see a lot of people coming out with products and saying well this has this nutrition in it and you're you're all the time fighting that battle of kind of coming back and trying to challenge it back in terms of what's accurate there so I think the social media has had a big push and um, with that as well and so as as I suppose you're all communicators you know you're fighting against with yourself and you're kind of trying to fight against misinformation that's yeah. out there. Yeah, I mean, again, uh, you can see that one of the real advances has been technology, and it brings with it a lot of benefits, but there is these uh, costs and these issues as well around misinformation that's out there. And as professionals, it's, it's difficult to sometimes keep up with some of the misinformation that's there. And when you're working with, uh, uh, with clients and athletes and they've picked something up somewhere, they've read something that this is the next superfood or this is going to give you a good boost, uh, you've then really got to check and balance with that. You've got to really then look at it. And, and again, you may be using technology to help you to understand it. And sometimes some of this information is coming through and it's useful. Uh, but a lot of the times it's not. So the information technology is, is the area that's really moved forward very, very quickly. I, I remember going back to the development of, uh, of this product in the mid-90s, doing dietary analysis on, I think it was Diet Plan 5, which were a big floppy disk like that, and that was terrible to use. But you, know, you can see now where, where the products have really evolved and are really helping the professionals, and I think that that's where we really get into is tools that help the professionals to do a better job. And I suppose, Danielle, you're at the, currently at the, the coal face of that because you're collecting data uh, from people for, um, I suppose, adding to a general data set. But what's it like collecting food data now from a group of people in terms of ensuring that, it's, that they're keeping up with it, that you're getting a complete picture? I suppose it saved me two weeks of my life. I didn't have to enter 644 food diaries over the last, over Christmas, so I'm enjoying my Christmas. Yeah. Um, I suppose it allowed us to have more time to spend with our participants. We were able to be there on site if there was any glitches. The food was inputted in advance. The recipes were the exact recipes that were used within that establishment. Um, the researchers were able to check if milk was added to cereal, if butter was added to bread, and each then participant was checked as they went out the door. So it allowed for greater control within that environment, and it allowed us to get better quality data as well. Is there a, uh, a bit, like, is there a kind of a hearts and minds thing when it comes to asking people to write down what they eat? Is there a stigma attached to tracking your food? Like, because it's, well, I'm not a professional and I'm not, I, I, you know, I'm not in Weight Watchers. So, like, you know, but it's something we don't really do. It's not a natural thing to do mm -hmm. to, to track what you eat, but, but it's, it's very useful to get that data, isn't it? Yeah, well, I suppose in that environment, uh, we were trying to highlight the benefits. So if you tell us what you're eating, you know, is it linked to your health and performance? So this is the information that we need to know in order to advance research, advance what we can do for use later down the line. So I think if you go f at it from that angle, they will buy into it and they'll be more inclined to tell you the truth and track it accurately. Okay. Um, moving on... Uh, Nigel, I suppose the, the role of the, um, specifically in your case, you're in high performance sport uh, and in cycling, you can't mention cycling without talking about the other thing that cyclists sometimes ingest. Uh, what, like as a nutritionist, how do you, do you just have to go, look, this is just about the food. I don't care what the doctors are doing. You know, I just st stick to, does, is there ever a, a point where nutrition crosses over into, if this isn't food anymore, this is something else? 
Yeah, I mean, for me, uh, the reason I got interested in nutrition and sport was because I believe that people can be the best athletes in the world without uh, taking drugs. And uh, I've yet to be convinced that actually doping really does improve performance. I'm, I'm yet to really see the data. And when we look at now in a sport like where I work in, where I've uh, committed my career to, I've worked with uh, two different Tour de France uh, champions, and that sport is scrutinised more than any other. And uh, the the there is part of the the one of the issues within nutrition is ensuring or reducing the risk of people getting positive tests from contaminated nutritional products. And so there, is, there can be a grey line, but as a dietitian, as a nutritionist, if we understand about the role that diet and nutrition has on the body and performance, then we can use that for people to be the best athletes in the world by none. Just in terms of accidentally, even ac inadvertently, you talk about maybe whey powder that had hormones in it from the well, yeah. animals it came <laughs> yeah. from. Or, and, uh, I mean, a, a lot of the contaminations in the manufacturing processes. So it can be, you know, the people have been running lines with uh, with some products that are uh, they're banned. Uh, there, it's, it's a real it's a real potential issue in sports nutrition having contaminated products and. Uh, you know, we, we go to massive, massive lengths to help reduce that risk with the products that we use. But, you know, as a dietitian, we believe in, in feeding people and, and using nutritional products only when we really need to use them. So, you know, again, I've worked with, uh, with many Olympic champions and the cornerstone all the time has been their diet and the food. And, and again, when we look at using technology to help us understand what they're eating, that helps us to give one that better better grounded of actually what they're doing at the moment and then being able to provide better advice to help protect those athletes going forward. Uh, Niall, as somebody who's making a food, uh, what, is, what is the challenge now in, with whatever regulation is there, the consumer awareness and then you, know, you have technology to aid you, what is the challenge of launching a new food product into consumer society at this stage? Um. I suppose the one of the biggest challenges I certainly come across and as a dietitian working inside in the food industry it's quite interesting is that particularly small producers or, or early on products that go onto the market these people don't necessarily have the knowledge or the skill to know what they're actually doing is incorrect so there's an awful lot of false claims being put on packs so for example I was in Spire today and I saw a flu shot or an anti-flu shot actually that you could take so but which is basically just beetroot juice so there's a, um, so there's a lot of you know an awful lot of products coming out now that just um, even though there is very stringent regulation there I mean the ESFA article 13.5 I could probably read it off the top of my hand it's been my lifesaver and we would always make sure any claims that are on our pack are always in line with what is allowed and the nutrition and, and health article claims um, but a, you know a majority of those food producers out there do not have the knowledge that I'm lucky enough to have and therefore they're putting out information and the FSA and all the governing bodies can't be expected to um, well, they can be expected, they are expected to govern it, but it is very, very difficult to do it when there's, you know, new products coming on the market every single day and not even one new product, it could be 20, 30 new products coming through all the time. Um, but I do think that, um, you know, coming back to the likes of the advanced with, um, nutritics and stuff, if we can get those, the likes of those people who, we're not saying you have to go and do a degree in nutrition or whatever, but if we can get you onto these systems where by it flags up to say you cannot make that claim because the nutrition does not stack up to it. I think hopefully that will go some of the way to stop a lot of these bogus claims being put on, on front of pack. Because as well, you know, and I even see it, I've been a, a couple of months in the US now and bone broth is absolutely <laughs> massive over there. And it can cure everything from ulcerative colitis to increase your bone density mass to everything. And there's people making hundreds of millions of dollars from it. and. Now, the, the US is different because their claims are quite liberal, but over here, you're seeing it popping up as well. And I think a lot of these people, you know, we need to give them the tools and show them what is right and what is wrong, and that there's actually no evidence behind what these claims are, and they can actually have uh, a detrimental effect, particularly to people in vulnerable situations, yeah. Um, Sarah, I suppose it, you're kind of in, you're trying to stem the tide in some ways and, and help people. I suppose is, is the problem that 
say with social media, as you mentioned earlier, um, by the time you were finished explaining why that, that particular claim is rubbish, people have clicked on 20 links and read the headline, and it's a kind of a, there's an, there's an, it's, not a it's not a symmetrical fight. No, and it's what I'd get an awful lot from clients is I'd say, well, you can't say that and go, well, our competitor is saying it. And you're going, well, they shouldn't, but, you know, it is happening. And I think, I mean, you talk about bone broth. I worked with a company a few years ago that sold potatoes and they packaged up their potatoes and they sent me their packaging after they'd spent about 50,000 on it. And it claimed that potatoes would prevent cancer and, among other things, on a potato pack. And I'm trying to explain to them that you can't use that. And they said, well, we got it off the potato grower's website. And you're trying to say, well, they're not a food business. They can say whatever they like. It's like you can publish any book on nutrition and say whatever you like. But in terms of a food producer, you're bound by the legislation that's there. And I think, as you said, a lot of the smaller producers are just unaware of the legislation. Like the bone broth claims are innocently made in most cases, but they just, the actual nutrition doesn't stack up. And I do think it is that lack of knowledge, um, plus their competitors are doing it. So I've put it on my pack because they have it. And as I said, I am the person who goes in and says no an awful lot. And it's kind of hard because it is a headline and people have got this idea about something and you are tr then trying to you know, push back the tide with it. Uh, going back to, I suppose, the, the epitome of, you know, food study, Nigel, what, um, can you give us an idea, say, for a high-performance athlete, to what level are they now focused on the detail of their diet? And is it at, what, like that demo earlier, is it at that level of granularity now? Yeah. I, it all depends on uh, the athlete, uh, the time and cycle that they're in from a competition point of view. Uh, for me... If I'm working with a team, then what I want to try and do is create what I call a performance environment. And by that, what I'm really wanting to do is that the athletes have got the knowledge, understanding to make, make the right choices. And then from that, you may have some people who are needing something very, very, very specific, uh, something that's very detailed. And so I have spent time uh, where I've put very detailed plans together right down to the number of tomatoes, etc. And, uh, and it's interesting because the athletes will really follow it to the letter. So that's a massive responsibility where you have to really ensure that what you're putting together is uh, not just nutritionally correct, but also from a food uh, and a taste point of view is, is really good as well. So as a, as a dietitian and as a sports nutritionist, it's about looking at that science, looking at that individual, looking at the performance that you're wanting to do and bringing that into something very simple, which is food-based. So, I mean, for me, it's very interesting to be here tonight because I first started using Nutritics four years ago. I didn't realise that it was such a new product until I was talking to, to Damien. And I remember I first used it, I was in, uh, uh, in Kortrijk in uh, Belgium at uh, Paris-Roubaix, which is one of the big bicycle races, and I was putting a very specific plan together uh, for an athlete who then uh, went on to get a, a gold medal in uh, in the Rio Olympics. So are you saying that Nutritics directly resulted <laughs> no, in, a, in a gold I, medal? What, 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 what I'm saying is that actually the, the ability to use uh, a program like Nutritics really helped me to put something very specific together for an athlete for a certain length of time. But for people in the room who are dietitians and nutritionists, not what we're, we're not wanting people to develop a dependency culture. We want people to be able to make the decisions for themselves. But sometimes with very high-performing athletes, they don't want all of that noise. They require something very, very specific. So again, sometimes working with combat athletes, boxers, etc., getting that level of detail. And when we go to things like the Olympic Games, and we're looking at competition day. People don't want to think about what they're needing to do. They want to, they want to have a plan. They want to have a plan that they've used and they've got confidence with. And so they can just roll that out on competition day. And again, uh, I, I didn't mention this to Damien, but in, uh, at the Rio uh, Olympics, I think I put use Neutritics for about 10 or 15 different Olympic athletes there for their competition uh, uh, diet plans on the day. Very good. Um, Listen to Nigel talk about the athletes and how uh, closely they're monitoring their intake. Have you found, uh, Danielle, that simply by being part of the study and asking people who may never have recorded food before, that they're just more aware, more mindful of the food they're eating and more aware and more interested yeah. in it? And maybe from having finished the study, they will, you know, not, um, you know, uh, not focus intently on it, but just more aware of what they're eating. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, a lot of the females, there was 15 females in our study, and they were coming to us and asking, like their training load had increased near the end of the um, 12 weeks, and there was fluctuations in menstruation, and that's one of the early signs of energy deficiency. So when we looked back on their food diaries, you can see one of the girls had a coffee in the morning because she had a sore throat. She had coffee again for lunch and a better for dinner. So she was consuming the guts of six to 800 calories, but yet expending maybe maybe near that uh, so she doesn't have enough energy then for the rest of her body to function normally so trying to communicate that with them and then she went and seen the doctor and they reiterated the same message so I suppose it was good for her to see it there in her hand see what calories she was consuming and then know now where to go from there and it's interesting it's a very specific answer and obviously you can't give the medical answer you can merely mm -hmm. guide them in a particular direction but that kind of thing say if it was an athlete might have years ago just been called over training and maybe they wouldn't be looking at the food yeah in detail yeah well it's it's been known as the female athlete triad so it's where an athlete isn't consuming enough for to meet their normal body functions and then this has a knock-on effect on their menstruation which ultimately has a knock-on effect on bone health as well so um it was just highlighting that if if there is no estrogen in the system that then that has a knock-on effect you could be more inclined to pick up an injury so and that's what they don't want because at the end of the day, that's their career so they can't be in that position yeah. And, and potentially a relatively straightforward fix or a starter yeah. fix anyway. Yeah. Um, it's about, we've about five minutes or so. I th we'll go ask, is there anybody in the audience has questions for our panel? It's a great group, group of people to have in the one place at the time. If there's any questions, if there aren't, I'll ask another one myself, but I just wanted to check uh, <laughs> if anybody had anything. Or I'll, I'll give you the, I'll give you a notice. Of, I'll come back to you in 30 seconds. Did you have yourself, no? Oh, you were just, uh, sorry, I thought you were yeah. bidding there. You were just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, moving forward in your careers, and uh, what would you like to see? What's like? What would you, you know? What would you? Is there a thing, something that technology can do for you, or an attitude? Starting with yourself, Danielle. What? What? What do you? What? What do you want? Yeah. Well, from the feedback from the cadets, one of them was the barcode, and that's already been done. And the one I was thinking of was like healthier swaps. So if know the app can I speak to you I didn't realize that earlier you know so these things have been changed within the space of three to four weeks so it, it is happening and that would have been what I would have suggested and um, just like if they had an, a younger athlete like a female that was logging white bread that there could be somebody there saying a healthier option would be the brown bread and reasons for more fiber okay something, something like that uh, in, in, yeah and Janet Nigel what going forward what do you see as an exciting development or something you'd like to see happen in the area of nutrition well, one of the areas I'd really like to see develop further forward is to be able to, for all athletes out there, being able to access really good, credible information. Going back to what you uh, mentioned before around uh, drug taking in sport, a lot of people have taken drugs in sport because they haven't had an alternative message. And people like myself provide alternative messages, but that's a limited resource. So by using technology, we should be able to develop better credible information so that people do not feel that they need to use something like drugs in sport to perform, but use their diet and nutrition and talent. You can have an alarm going off the Nutritic Six if they try to take something. Yeah, yeah. I've already suggested some ideas to the guys. <laughs> Sir, what's that? Call the guards, exactly, yeah. <laughs> I mean, what I love about the, the new Nutritics is where it's highlighting back very directly to clients the nutrition. And what I would see, I mean, there's a huge growing interest in everyday people about nutrition and they're looking at different focus, whether it's weight or they're looking at energy or sports and so on. But they're still missing. I mean, the same nutrients are still missing. People are still missing iron. They are still missing calcium. And particularly with social media, there's such a drive away from foods like dairy and so on. And I think when you looked at the what you had, I mean, what I'd love that to shout out is, hey, your calcium's in your boots. Would you ever drink a glass of milk? You know, something like that, that actually flags up to people. Yes, you've got it all really well here and your macros are fantastic, but your micronutrients are a real problem or your iron is missing. And to call that out, because that's something that I would see hugely when we do workplace wellness now and doing clinics, particularly in if you're under 35, if you're into that those area and they're into nutrition, their calcium is just absent. And in men and is women. Is that, by the way, because people have, there's been a war on butter over the last... No, nothing to do with poor, unfortunate butter. Um, there's this war on dairy and there's, uh, I mean, 
mean, there's a huge push on vegan, which can be done really well, but it, it's it's a little bit difficult to get your calcium with vegan, and a lot of people aren't educated enough to know how to do that. So they've just dropped the milk, and they're not adding in the 16 servings of broccoli a day that you need to replace it. And, mm. you know, they, that's where it's, it's that kind of idea. So I think it's people trying genuinely to be healthy, but making very silly mistakes on it. And actually, the long-term health has been a running joke among some dietitians on Twitter that we hope all these social media people have good insurance for the osteoporosis claims they're going to run into. <laughs> You know, in 20 years. And so it's, I think, calling out that kind of information. And actually, if something is going to shout at you from your phone, I think that would be fantastic. I'm totally going to retweet those bone density jokes now. I'm going to stick it to them hard. Anyway, uh, um, Niall, apart from um, uh, your product being pinned to the front of Nutritix uh, as the only, <laughs> the only frozen yogurt option. And dairy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what would you, um, in general, in... in in the industry, what would you like to see more of or more awareness of? Um, well, what I'd like to see less of is bogus claims. Um, and I honestly think that one of the ways in doing that is anybody who's starting a food business, the majority of these people go on food startup courses and whatever. And if we have a tool like Nutritics that can potentially guide them in the right direction, I think that will hopefully go a long way. Now, you will still get people who don't care in a way, and we'll put it on back of, on the pack and hopefully will eventually get caught. But hopefully it will allow the FSA and the governing bodies and the HSE to be able to hone in on the people who are blatantly breaking the law because they want to and they're you know trying to get one up on the competitor. Um, and I suppose the other piece always, like I may be involved in the food industry, but I will always be a dietitian, I suppose, would be um, in terms of uh, access, again, it comes back to the accessibility piece, but I think stuff like this is making people easier to understand, kind of reiterating what um, Sarah was saying there around, you know, you're on this crazy vegan paleo slash moon diet, um, you know, and like literally you haven't had calcium, you've had extremely minimal amount of calcium and iron in the last six weeks and you're at serious risk of, you know, yeah. If this goes on long term to, to adverse health conditions, you need um, intravenous uh, <laughs> frozen yogurt. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> NG, we'll do NGs. Yeah. I, uh, I'm always amused by paleo because I just think if a paleo, an actual paleolithic person came around now and this, they would just go, I would love a breakfast roll. Like, that, that, uh, <laughs> like why? Like, I, you know, I've, I've eaten dead crow off a bush, uh, my uncle has cut off my arm, just give me what you have, why are you, why are you rejecting it? But anyway, um, I, I were near, the, just, was there any other questions? Uh, there wasn't anything else, was there? Uh, so I guess, uh, as we're actually on time, so let us give a huge round of applause to our great panel, Daniel Logue, uh, Niall Maloney, Sarah Kyo, and Nigel Mitchell.